Hey everyone, welcome back to the last presentation or the last class of Young Engineers for the semester. Um, as I originally predicted, um, we're going to be doing something different for today and today only really. It's just sort of a, a nice one-off little thing to um, end on a more relaxing note. If we get through it, you know, a little bit early, that's fine. We'll just go ahead and, you know, end the class early. Um, if we take the whole hour, we take the whole hour. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll go through this. We'll talk about, you know, sort of what's coming in the in the near and not so near future for engineering. What's sort of the cutting edge of engineering and science and things like that. And uh, it'll be a pretty relaxed class today. I think that's pretty fitting for our for our last one for the semester, you think? At any rate, let's go ahead and uh, get started on this. So when we say what's on the horizon in engineering, it's a few different um, fields that we're going to be looking at. Not everything, obviously, but a, but a few different fields. Um, we're going to start first and foremost with biomedical engineering. That seems probably the most appropriate considering what we just spent time going over, the, you know, the human body and uh, the nervous system and, and uh, synthetic life and things like that. Um, well, as far as biomedical engineering is concerned, the, uh, just recently the world's first bionic Olympics was hosted. Um, and that was basically where, you know, people around the world got to compete in a, uh, an Olympics style event, but, you know, they had bionic arms or, um, you know, mind interfaces or something like that. Now you might be thinking, oh, you know, so they got to jump 30 story tall buildings and, you know, punch through concrete and stuff like that, you know, the technology's not there yet. Uh, a lot of it, you know, we might look at it and scoff and be like, oh, well, that was the Olympics. But given the fact that they're using cutting edge technology, it's pretty cool to see what they can accomplish um, with, you know, bionic arms and things like that. But basically, yeah, athletes with disabilities will pilot their respective cutting-edge assistive devices to compete in six major events or disciplines. And by bringing together individuals from fields such as medicine, robotics, and communication, the event seeks to encourage future collaboration and innovation. Essentially, it's a showcase for um, what's new and, and cutting-edge in, uh, uh, in the world of bionics and cybernetics and things like that, and also to encourage people to sort of talk about this more, you know, get, get people maybe into it who were not exposed to it before and be like, oh, well, that exists, but, I, I'm, you know, there, there could be a way to improve it by doing this or whatever, you know, by increasing its awareness, you increase the number of people sort of working to solve uh, that problem or whatever that problem may be. But that's been sort of one of the points of something like this. And actually, for all of these, we've got a nice video showing um, what exactly... Uh, uh, oh, okay. Um, what exactly, you know, that all involves, as you can see, he's using his, he's putting things up on a clothesline, which again, you and I could probably do without thinking about, but the fact that he's doing it with a prosthetic arm that is controlled by, you know, either directly or indirectly by his, uh, by his brain, that's pretty remarkable. There we go. This might be difficult to hear, but that's okay. It's just mostly for the visuals anyway.
one frame per sp second on this video. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do this, and I can send it out to the, the audience. Whoops, I accidentally sent that one message to everybody. Uh, yeah, so that's the Bionic Olympics. Sorry, I'm just throwing things into chat accidentally. Um, but yes, so again, looking at all this stuff, uh, some of it's actually very, very cutting edge things. So you're, you're talking about mind machine interfaces and, um, you know, prosthetic limbs and stuff like that. Things that, that we've sort of run into a, a frustrating wall with in the last 15, 20 years that we're just now starting to overcome um, with a greater understanding of how the nervous system works and with faster computers and, uh, and all of these things, which, which are all, there, there are a lot of cross-disciplinary, um, there is a lot of cross-disciplinary knowledge going into creating things like this. So it's, it's actually fairly impressive to see all the things that they can do. In addition, there's also, you know, Things like being able to, uh, on the subject of my machine interfaces, I should say, um, paralyzed woman communicates through thought. One of the first examples of this. Um, after a 28-week test of the system, so it took them about six months, um, the subject was able to have a control over the interface with 95% accuracy. Um, that's pretty impressive. The to have a, a machine that's able to uh, communicate with the brain and have a 95% accuracy uh, result, given how complex the brain is and generally how little we understand it. Um, now, brain-computer inter interfaces now have a solid foundation on which to continue to build on this technology. Um, so it can be, you know, communication. Um, as we understand it better, it can be controlling artificial limbs and things like that. So as we as humans get more comfortable and, and, and uh, proficient at things like mind-machine interfaces, the, the possibilities expand with that sort of thing. AI and computer technology. This one's always interesting. So synthetic intelligence, uh, the future of AI and us. Uh, <coughs> this next video is it's basically just uh, President Obama uh, sitting in, in an interview to talk about the current state and the future of AI technology. Um, so again, that's a, that's a video I'll link uh, because on that one, sound is more important, obviously. Uh, but it's not necessarily you know, going to be one of those things where, like, it's necessarily an exhibition of, um, existing artificial intelligence as nearly as much as, you know, um, yeah, nearly as much as, uh, the, the previous video was.
This is a decently long video too. Yeah, no worries. It happens. Oops. <clears throat> so, yeah, that is uh, a talk about, you know, the possibilities of AI and where it stands right now. Um, an example is the Amazon Smart Store. Um, the retail space in Seattle, it's 1,800 square feet. It has no checkout lanes, and then customers just simply choose the items they want and are automatically charged when they leave the store. Um, it doesn't exist yet. It will soon. Um, but it's another example of how AI and machine learning are taking over jobs once held by humans, you know, the, like the automated checkout lanes, except <laughs> on steroids. Um, but yeah, here's here's an example of that. Hold on, let me grab the link for that. So that's a pretty neat example. Um, I mean, obviously there are questions around it. I'm sure that you guys have. I have a couple, but it's one of those things where I don't know. 
there are people a lot smarter than me who have already thought about those things, so I'm sure there are answers to them. Like, I don't know what happens if you don't have enough money to buy all this stuff. No idea. Now there's IBM's growable computer chips, um, where scientists have devised a way, inspired by nature, of coaxing carbon nanotubes to build themselves into structures that could be used to replace silicon chips. Um, now, if this ends up working, then it could lead to faster than silicon uh, chips, faster than silicon computer chips, and bendable electronics, which means that you could have like wearable technology stuff you could wear on your wrist and things like that. So, carbon nanotubes are Yeah, that's essentially my question, Jacob. You know, who knows? The, I'm sure there's something, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly what their answer is. So yeah, um, carbon nanotubes are, are sort of a holy grail of material science um, because they promise a lot of things that uh, sort of solve a, a lot of issues that we have in our current electronics um, knowledge, like uh, heat distribution and, and conductivity and strength and things like that. Um, it remains to be seen how that's all going to pan out, of course, because a lot of these things uh, have been sort of perpetually something in the near future, um, but it does seem like the changes that are, are occurring are more promising than, than a lot of the, the sort of theoretical stuff that happened in the past. Now, mechanical engineering. Um, flying car. I mean, who doesn't want a flying car? 160 to 190 mile an hour top speed uh, as a prototype, and uh, other companies are looking to bring flying cars to the market as well, but there are regulation issues. Um, you know, you have to deal with the FAA and the fact that you've got more flying things. But yeah, here's a video. Yeah, it is pretty small, but again, it's just a prototype, you know? It's it's a one-fifth scale. Uh, so the the actual thing would be five times the... It would actually be five times the length, the width, and the height, which means that it would be a much, much larger um, vehicle than just, you know, five times larger. This is meant to show off a proof of concept. Then, of course, there's 2018, which is Elon Musk's 
uh, planned unmanned mission to Mars. Um, a lot of these, you know, it's just sort of uh, a lot of missions to Mars and colonizing Mars and things like that involve or plans for these things involve uh, unmanned flights that occur before the manned flights in order to set up a lot of the necessary infrastructure in order for humans to be able to survive there. Um, you know, a lot of these plans involve having a robot go there first and setting up like a base camp and, you know, sort of a, an infrastructure for the necessary things like water and oxygen and things like that. Um, so that when humans get there, obviously they don't have to rely like they don't have, they don't have to set up a lot of that stuff themselves, which increases their chances of surviving. Because if something goes wrong during that process, um, they would have to wait nine months for backup from Earth, which is not doable at all. Um, you know, if you guys have seen The Martian, I haven't yet, but I I know it well enough to, to know that that's directly related to this. Um, that you know, it's it's a very uh, an ideal position to be in. Now, materials engineering. Materials engineering is a lot of interesting stuff, like diamond batteries from nuclear waste. So basically, science scientists have developed uh, a means of converting nuclear uh, plant waste into sustainable diamond batteries. Now, these batteries could be a clean and safe way to power spacecraft and satellites and even medical devices. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, um, and the the fact that they use nuclear waste uh, means that they essentially solve two problems at once. They there's a there's an issue of power generation and power storage. Excuse me. Um, that a lot of spacecraft and satellites have to deal with. It's actually a very big problem. And uh, then there's the issue of what to do with nuclear waste that exists in the U.S. There are, are actually, believe it or not, there are actually multiple solutions to solving the nuclear waste issue, but um, this could potentially be something that actually gets funding in order to fix that. You know, who knows? Uh, a few of the solutions for waste involve creating nuclear plants that use the waste. Um, and their byproducts would be more inert um, materials, but that's that's a that's another discussion for another day. And frankly, one I'm probably not qualified enough to uh, to have with you guys without just throwing out some wild misinformation. Anyway, here's this video.
So, I mean, the prospect of a 5,000, well, really, um, at least a 5,000 year life battery is pretty, uh, pretty promising and uh, pretty enticing. Of course, it comes with questions of their own. How much power does it end up putting out? Um, no, actually, it, it, it isn't. Um, not as much as people would like you to think, especially because we can create them in a lab. Um, there, there's actually a whole other discussion for another day about the perceived rarity of diamonds and um, whether or not that's a justified thing or if it's something to artificially inflate the market, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, again, someone more qualified than me could comment on that, but at, at any rate, um, There, there are questions that could be that that could be asked and and potentially answered by by other people about that. You know, how much power does it put out? Does an increased power draw drain it faster, uh, or does it just put out a constant power draw? Um, is it possible for it to you know does it does it lose some of its uh, conductivity if it you know gets thrown around or takes some damage or something like that? Could it be uh, you know um, that as the as the uh, the the carbon fourteen, the radioactive diamond inside, releases some of its radioactivity, it makes the the casing, uh, the diamond casing that's not radioactive, more radioactive. So it becomes more dangerous as its lifetime, you know, goes on. Who knows? Um, how much radioactivity does it put out unprotected? Um, is that a serious health concern? You know, that these these are things that like. They aren't necessarily answered here. These are very these are very optimistic looks at these things as opposed to realistic looks at these things. But again, it's good to know that these things exist. And part of making optimism realism is learning to find ways to answer those questions in order to make you know these 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 ideas realistic um, uh, sort of realistic uh, examples of technology that exist in in uh, society. So these are all things for you know, for you guys to think on. Um, these aren't necessarily predictions about what the next 20 years are going to look like uh, because life always goes in directions that nobody expects. These, these aren't even predictions for what the next 50 years are going to look like because things happen. Discoveries are made and, and, and uh, uh, setbacks are encountered and things like that. And so you'll find that technologies that we thought looked promising don't end up panning out. But on the other hand, there there's something that just comes up out of nowhere. Some some scientist is messing around in a lab or something like that and they discover a new property to something and suddenly that can be implemented cheaply and easily and, and the technology that you thought was going to happen uh, doesn't end up happening. Like it, uh, 50s sci-fi always talks about people wearing like personal jetpacks and, and robots and and uh, you know artificial intelligence and things like that, and we're just now sort of coming to the point where we're like, yeah, so maybe we could have a flying car in the next thirty years, um, maybe. And you know we're we're looking at the the future of AI. We're going like, okay, so we still don't really know how to answer that question, but like we're getting better with other types of AI. But then by the same token, they never would have anticipated smartphones or the internet. Like they they never would have anticipated that kind of stuff. I mean there there are. I say never. There are examples of science fiction out there that have analogs to that kind of thing, but they're not exactly like how they imagined it. And there's, you know, they, they didn't anticipate this sort of um, cultural revolution that comes from things like this. The the way that society is changed entirely and and irre irrevocably by these by these technologies. Um, so it, life always takes us in funny directions. Um, science generally doesn't work out like we anticipate it's going to. We're very terrible at predicting what the future is going to be like, scientifically speaking. I, probably not, no. Um, like I said, maybe in the next 30 years, but there are so many things that have to be worked out before they can exist. Um, you know, a lot of these things are going to have to be automated because... Uh, 
people have proven that they're a very uh, a very dangerous wild card when it comes to driving. Like when you're driving, a lot of times the most dangerous thing is everybody else driving around you. Um, because people introduce an element of unpredictability that uh, makes driving very very dangerous. And when you add when you add a third dimension to that, suddenly it becomes a lot more dangerous. Now you can you can crash. And when you crash, it's not just like you hit a wall at 30 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour. It could be that you hit the ground at 230 miles an hour. Kind of a problem. You could slam into another car at 190 miles an hour, that sort of thing. So a lot of, uh, one of the big hitches is um, people don't want to release uh, flying cars until, uh, at least for, as I understand it, until we can have a computer competently pilot one of these things for people. And that introduces its own host of problems. You know, it has to be, it has to be reliable enough. It has to be vetted by the FAA. The FAA has to grow as an organization in order to keep track of all the flying things um, out there in the sky and coordinate everything. Um, and the sort of our infrastructure will have to change to accommodate that. Um, how are you going to, you know, are you, are you going to allow flying cars to be owned by individuals or are they going to be, are they going to be, uh, community things like a, like a rideshare sort of a thing? Um, if they're owned by people, you know, how do you, how do you handle parking garages and stuff like that? Um, the, the issue of parking still exists. It just becomes different now. Um, <clears throat> So then if you have community vehicles, is it municipally owned? Do, do cities pay for them? Do the, does the state pay for them? Do private organizations pay for them? Do you hire like a taxi company to come and pick you up in a flying car? And if so, how do you vet the safety for these taxi companies? Uh, do you have another governor, government organization that makes sure that all of these taxis, these, these flying taxis are, are properly safe and everything like that? Um, so, like I said, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered before these kinds of things exist, and there are a lot of things that need to be changed in the way that we think about cars. Because one of the one of the hardest things about all of this is probably one of the most efficient ways to do it would be to go through a communal route. Because having everybody own a flying car would just mean that there's so much stuff in the sky that it's impossible to keep track of. Almost not really, but like it's 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 a it's a very very complex thing to introduce. Um, but we have sort of a you know a a cultural norm in the U.S., and that is that people own cars. I mean, it, I'm not saying that I feel this way, but I'm saying that the general thought in the U.S. is that if you don't own a car, you must be poor. Or there's something, you know, going on in your life that prevents you from owning a car. You know, it's, it's almost it's almost unheard of in most places of the U.S. just because it's so unfeasible um, that somebody might not own a car. You know, a lot of the way our infrastructure is laid out, you have to drive somewhere. It's not convenient for you to bike or walk or take public transportation somewhere because a lot of these systems aren't really in place enough. And a lot of our stuff is spread out far enough. Now, granted, it's a different story in urban centers and things like that. But again, it depends on what the urban center is. Um, I grew up very close to L.A. And despite the fact that L.A. is a very urban area and Everything's spread out far enough that you generally need a car. On top of that, cars are a status symbol for them. So it's it's a way of expressing yourself beyond just having a car. So if we start to introduce this whole thing about, well, you know, if you want a flying car, you can't really own it. You got to rent one for, you know, all of your trips and stuff like that. Well, that certainly makes things more difficult. On top of that, you know, if a lot of people start using flying cars and stuff like that well then you're going to have to if it's a if it's a if it's a community thing uh you're going to have to start coordinating all of these trips and you're going to have to have automated systems for that as well like i said tons and tons of questions now next semester spring of 2017 what are going to go what are we going to be going over well uh there's going to be some cnc milling um so we're going to be going over other mill and shop bot well you're going to be doing that in the lab but um, you're going to be going over other mill and shop bot. We're probably going to be going over uh, a whole host of programs related to that, uh, like 3D modeling programs and 
uh, stuff like fusion and things like that. So that'll be interesting. Um, cybersecurity, so uh, you know, hacking and and protection against that and uh, that sort of thing. So that should be pretty interesting. Uh, aerospace, you guys will be building rockets and labs. Um, that should be pretty cool as well. Programming and racing quadcopters. And uh, yeah, so next semester should be pretty interesting. Uh, hopefully, you know, I'll see you guys then. Hopefully we'll, we'll pick up right where we left off and, and do some, some really interesting stuff. We're going to learn how to hack things. No, no. I mean, I don't know what the curriculum looks like yet. I believe that's actually an entirely new topic for us. Um, you might learn in a very general sense how, um, you know, uh, security might be breached in a, in a given thing, like a, a, what, what, what security loopholes might exist in programs and stuff like that, but I'm not going to walk you guys through how to do it. And on top of that, uh, hacking is generally uh, a social science. <sighs> how to DDoS? Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. Run a script. Done. There you go. You're, you're a hacker now. Oh, sorry. Um, ugh, DDoSing. Leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Um, hacking is, is as much a social science as it is a computer science. Um, it's also taking advantage of, because a lot of times one of the weakest links in computer programming or in, in computer security is the people who use those systems. You know, your system is only as secure as your people program it. And those who use it are able to keep track of their passwords. If they, you know, keep their, if they keep a post-it note on their computer with their password on it, obviously your system has a weak link there. And that weak link is that post-it of the password. If somebody can find that, they can get in. Um, uh, people have, you know, th there are many different ways to go about getting into secure computer systems which don't involve actually writing a line of code. Um, and those are, technically speaking, hacking as well. Um, but yeah, so we'll be going over a lot of stuff next semester. Um, hopefully it should be, should be very interesting to you guys. Um, but with that, we're not going to be going over that, Jacob. We might talk about it a little bit, but we're not going to be going over that. Um, with that, you know, question and answer time, uh, I'm going to skip the poll questions because, well, this was just a very easy class today. And, uh, you know, yeah, you guys are more than welcome to, to hang out and ask any questions about anything. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to head out as well. Like I said, very easy class today. Um, if you're coming back in the spring, well, I'll see you then. Have a wonderful couple of weeks. If not, well, I really hope you enjoyed everything. Um, I hope that you could pull something from this. Uh, I hope that it that it provided you with some inspiration for something, at least you know the the seed of something that you could then cultivate and turn into some sort of engineering career for you in the future. Um, if not, well, then hey, maybe you learned something here at some point about that too. No problem, Abigail. Um, I'm glad to have all you guys in my class. Um, I'm really, I'm actually, it really makes me happy when, when people talk and respond to me because then I know you guys are listening and that you guys are engaged in it. Um, so I'm glad you guys have been very communicative and, uh, you know, willing to, to, to talk with me about this stuff and throw out ideas and things like that. I really enjoy that. Um, but yes, if I see you in the spring, enjoy yourselves. Have a great couple of weeks. If I don't, Best of luck in everything you do, and hopefully you pulled at least something useful away from this. But yeah, thank you.